you remember very well, yesterday we had such a wonderful conversation with uh, Athena Jones alongside Chelsea Clinton on creating safety for women's health around the world. And to build upon that wonderful uh, foundation that they laid, we have the CEO, the founder, and the editor of Front Page Media, Media Francisca Donna, to engage with us on breaking barriers around women's mental health. Let's give uh, Francisca a wonderful round of applause as she joins us. Hello, everybody. We are doing a panel on mental health, and there was a little bit of anxiety going on <laughs> back there because we're on stage and it's a big deal. So I'm just going to take a moment. We can take a big, deep breath. I'm really not an expert in this. I don't know what I'm doing, but I <laughs> make an effort anyway. Uh, we have my wonderful panelists here and another panelist joining us from Kenya, who I will introduce in a moment. But I wanted to begin with just a couple of words. Almost a year ago today, I sat on this stage and moderated a panel about mental health. <laughs> Here we are one year later, and not that much has changed. It's really dispiriting. We see the mental health crisis reach its long fingers into every corner of the world. Women, men, girls, boys. The young are especially at risk. Women are especially at risk. Older people are at risk. And how common is this? In 2019, the World Health Organization estimated one in eight people were experiencing a mental health crisis. In COVID, the statistic rose to about one in four. The number today likely lies around one in five. If you look around you, that's about 20% of this room. 20 to 25% of women are likely to suffer depression in their lifetime. And so what? So what of these often invisible disorders? Perhaps you can't see it, but you can feel it. The effects are far-reaching, they're dangerous, they can be economically catastrophic. Recent numbers show a global cost to society of six trillion euros. 12 billion workdays are lost each year due to depression and anxiety. It really is the problem we don't want to see, but here to see it today, I have three amazing individuals who are making waves in the world to make the invisible seen, heard, and addressed. So I'm going to introduce you to my panelists, and then we are going to turn it over to them because they are experts, and they are amazing. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Tom Osborne. You can hopefully see him on a screen. Oh, good, there he is. He is the co-founder of Shamiri Institute, and he is joining us today from Kenya. Welcome, Tom. Uh, in the middle here, I have Marion Le Boyer. She is a professor and the directrice of the Fondation Fondamentale, which promotes collaborative medical research in the field of mental health. Thank you for being here. And here in the purple, I have Angelina Spicer. She is a comedian, yay, and an accidental activist in the area of maternal health, and she's based in the US. So welcome. Uh, Marion, I want to begin with you. Back in December 2020, in the thick of COVID, a survey you did found absolutely terrible numbers of young people and women experiencing symptoms of mental health challenges. How do the numbers look today? Is there any room to hope? So it's true that COVID has tremendously increased the number of people affected with depression, anxiety, sleep problem, addiction, and the number are still very alarming and still increasing, in particular because of all the, the actions and the problems that we're facing, the global warming, the wars, all sorts of actions and events that increase the burden of mental health, in particular in young adults and in women. Did you like that I phrased the question, is there any room to hope? 
<laughs> I, think, I, I think it's been stamped out, but okay. But okay, since we're at the Women's Forum, let's just talk for a quick minute. Why do you think women in particular are well, experiencing this? First, may I answer your question? Yes, there is hope, and the first reason to have hope <laughs> is that we are speaking about it. And I think yeah. this is really very important to be able to increase knowledge, talk about it, speak about it. So this is really a reason for hope. There are plenty of other reasons for hope, but this one is an important one. And any thoughts on why women in particular are experiencing the Well, this is level? an area which is probably under-researched, so we know the figures, but probably we need more money and more interest to better understand why women are more at risk. They're not more at risk for all psychiatric disorders. There are plenty of disorders with equality between gender, but it's truly the case, for example, for depression. You just mentioned it. Women are twice more at risk than males probably for biological reasons, for uh, environmental reasons, for lots of factors that need to be studied. Yeah. Angelina, you have focused specifically on maternal mental health in the United States. Can you describe for our international audience here what the situation is like in the US and why we need to focus on that so desperately? Yeah, similar to what the doctor mentioned, in the US, maternal mental health is just completely unaddressed. It's under-researched, it's underfunded, um, and it hasn't been until recently where the conversations have just begun to start happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, mostly maternal health conditions are, they lie in the shadows, moms suffer in silence, and there isn't really any sort of help or outreach for where we can go when we have, when we have these experiences. Um, and when I had severe postpartum depression and anxiety, I didn't know that other women had also experienced this. So there was a huge, just a gap in just the knowledge that, on my own part of the women in my family who had experienced it neighbors, the women in my mommy and me groups, uh, women at the park. It was, I just felt like, oh my gosh, I am literally the only person suffering right now. And at the time, I didn't have a name for it. I didn't know that it was clinical maternal depression. I didn't know that I also had a, a anxiety at the same time. So I just felt like I was drowning and that I was failing miserably, and I didn't know who to ask for help from. Yeah. Oh, yes. May I, just to add something, it's not specific to the States, it's exactly the same in France, and I want to mention something which is really sad, which is that the first cause of death in the perinatal period, and in particular in postpartum period, is suicide because of undiagnosed and untreated perinatal depression. So this is really something to improve, again, in terms of information, but also of diagnosis, because it can be treated. Yeah. 100%, and I'd also like to add that since I've become an, ad an advocate, and as I call myself, an accidental activist, um, since I came to this work and started just sharing my story and blending it with comedy in such a unique way, I have found like the doctor mentioned, that this is really a n normal experience for many women, yeah. right? Uh, our work uh, has, has really expanded beyond just the U.S. and in my work, particularly in, in Israel and in Tanzania and Rwanda and in Ghana, I noticed that women are experiencing the same levels of depression. Doctors are not really sure what to do, how to, how to implement screening systems. Uh, in Israel, they had a really great pilot program in Jerusalem that I, um, that I took part of or partnered with them on was, um, was with a, a neighborhood clinic called Tipat Chalav. And at the, it's literally called a drop of milk. And at these clinics, or at this one clinic in Jerusalem, they offer screenings to moms uh, and they do holistic care for mom and baby. They offer all kinds of comprehensive services to these women, and it's a pilot program that was funded by the Ministry of Health in Israel, and hopefully soon they'll have the funding to continue that work throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know now in Israel, they, 
and in that region, we do need a lot more support and services for women who are pregnant or just had babies. But that's just a really clear example of seeing a problem, seeing a need, and finding a way to at least start to implement a solution. Totally, but it still feels so much like the rarity of mostly it's sort of not seeing the problem, not recognizing the need, and the solutions are still so few and far between. Tom, you're up. Um, I, I want to bring you into this conversation. Um, so you are calling in from Kenya, and I wonder if it's okay to ask you a little bit to paint us a picture of what the status of mental health is like in Kenya right now, and how prevalent is the problem? Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and, and really excited to be calling in from, from Kenya and joining this wonderful panel um, on mental health. Um, so I run Shamiri. Shamiri is a Swahili word for thrive. Uh, we work with young people aged 12 to 25, that's a primary uh, demographic, and, and we try to give them access to mental health that is one, community-based and community-oriented, um, second, uh, non-stigmatizing, um, and, and third, you know, um, grounded um, on holistic, you know, um, human emotions and experiences rather than psychopathology. So the reason why Shamir exists is, you know, because Kenya is a, and Africa in general is a very youthful continent. So the median age uh, in the continent is 19, um, so it's pretty young. Uh, over 70% of the population is age 30 um, and below. And so a big burden of mental health is on very young people, um, and especially young girls and young women. So um, from some of the studies we've done, we find that sometimes as much as one in two uh, young people in Kenya screen for either depression or anxiety. Um, and, and, and also what we are observing in Kenya, similar to what is being observed elsewhere in the world, uh, is young girls and young women tend to be um, they tend to have more prevalence for depression and, and anxiety symptoms. Yeah, so, so that's kind of where we are, we are around prevalence. Uh, unfortunately, people can't get um, care because of three issues. Um, so the first, obviously, is the stigma that is the consequence of the, you know, very violent um, legacy of colonial psychiatry and colonial mental health. Um, where you know people are taken to asylums um, and where mental health is used as a social political tool of control. The second is because of a lack of enough caregivers. Um, so in Kenya, for example, you only have two child and adolescent psychiatrists serving the whole country and about one caregiver for every one million people. Um, and the third is care tends to be inaccessible from a price perspective. You know, so the cost of seeing therapy. Um, can be as much as $1,200 per year, which is already half of the GDP per capita, which just makes it not accessible for many people. There was so much packed into this, so I want to go back to a lot of different things, but um, I, w I wonder if you would just talk a little bit specifically about what that community-based model looks like, and especially as it's kind of pushing aside this this one-to-one -one model that isn't really pragmatic in Kenya or desirable um, but but what does what does the what does that community model really look like on a on a on a practical level and where is it happening great thank you and, and so what we are trying to do is to move away um, from the Western model of care um, which has been come you know almost the global gold standard. Um, and the reason we're trying to move away from that um, is, uh, one, it's inaccessible, it also advances stigma. Um, and specifically because we've turned mental health and mental health care into a very isolating experience of having to go and see someone on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which is already traumatizing, you know, which already, you know, kind of assumes that something is wrong with you, right? Uh, and so we're trying to flip that on its head and bring care at the community level, so at the school level, at the church level, at the mosque level, wherever you know people um, are gathered, and to the extent possible, uh, make therapy a group exercise. Um, so really, um, doing a lot of group-based therapy, you know, where young people form groups um, of six to fifteen people and go through therapy together. Well, we also tend to tap into the existing 
human resources that we have. So looking at the lay providers, community health workers, social workers, the clergy, you know, how, they're already doing the bulk of the caregiving from a mental health perspective. So how can we train and support them to be able to do this effectively and efficiently? Well, and so right now we're doing this for about 40,000 young people um, across Kenya um, just this year alone. Um, so it's a very community-based approach where care is at the school, um, at the church level, mostly group-based, uh, primarily led by, you know, um, lay providers, social workers, or the clergy. But of course, we also do have a mechanism for upward referral to the few psychologists and psychiatrists who are there. What we're trying to do is make the core of the caregiving be at this community group-based um, um, level. This is so interesting to me. And, you know, one of the things that it's doing, in addition to kind of triaging who needs what kind of care and sort of cases that can be escalated, but only in certain cases, is also, my favorite word is coming up here in relation to mental health, normalizing the issue, normalizing talking about it, talking about it in these sort of settings where it's just as, as, as normal as asking, how are you? How's the weather? Have you done your homework? And, you know, Angelina, I'd like to, to, to hear from you a little bit. So, so you, you know, you, 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 as far as I understand it, you started on this journey when you became pregnant and you found that there was a really big delta between the reality of this situation, the expectations, how wonderful you probably thought it could be and, 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 how, and how brutal and challenging it was. And I wonder if you could tell the room a little bit about that and then I'd like you to talk about how you've normalized that by finding the funny in it. Um, you are a comedian, it's what you do, it's, I know it's what you can't help doing. Um, so, so, so maybe start with your story and then let's talk about how you've kind of managed to normalize that and how you even got permission to do such a thing. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you for asking. Um, I am a planner by nature. I like to plan my life. I like, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm not type A, but I'm very much of like, this is what I want my life and my look and everything to be, right? So I found my man and I, and, but I wasn't quite sure, you know, as women we're like, mm, <laughs> I like you, I love you, but mm, is this forever? Right? So my husband and I, we waited. We waited for six years. And my mom, who's in the front row, was very much like, um, when are we having children? Like, when are we, <laughs> when am I gonna be a grandma? And I was like, mommy, I'm gonna be a star, honey. I'm gonna be a star, right? So I was, I was literally like, well, you know, my dream at the time, my dreams have changed. Uh, but my dream at the time was to be on Saturday Night Live. I have a very robust <laughs> following on social media, and I create content, and I make people laugh online. Not only that, I am a working comedian in Los Angeles, right? I was working on the Conan O'Brien show for eight years, doing a full range of characters from what they call Snow Black, Hmm. Not Snow White, but Snow Black. That was me. Uh, <laughs> I played Mrs. Butterworth on Conan for like eight years. Uh, I was a regular sketch performer on the, Jimmy Fa on the Jimmy Kimmel show for years. I worked on CBS. I mean, all the networks, all the things that was my life. And I was a stand-up, a professional stand-up comic. So that was my dream. I found my man, but I was like, I want my dreams to come true. And I was working um, as, a, as a performer, but no one knew me, right? Okay, let's just be real. And <laughs> I was waiting for that moment, <laughs> right? And then uh. Saturday Night Live happened for other people, and then it didn't happen for me, and then that's when I told my husband, I was like, okay, now is the time. <laughs> and as soon as I said, now is the time, I was pregnant <laughs> right away. And uh, obviously, we wanted my daughter. My, my husband is educated. He's professional. So am I. I graduated from Howard University. So we are like middle class folks who planned their lives and wanted to have children. We got pregnant. I had an OBGYN who I had gone to for years. Um, and I had a normal pregnancy up until around 30 weeks. At 30 weeks, I was marked high risk because my daughter was not growing according to those 
crazy charts. All the moms in the rooms know <laughs> that they give you these crazy charts and they're like, oh, her femur's long or her head is small. Mm -hmm. You're like, what? <laughs> right? And you get panicked. But, uh, but at that point, that's when I was marked high risk and that's when I did not know that I was developing anxiety. Mm. So, Fast forward eight weeks later, I had my daughter, we were fine, until they laid her on my chest. And when they laid her on my chest, I was like, I'm not ready. Yeah. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had been preparing for the delivery and not motherhood. And that it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm, I, I, I felt powerless. I felt like I had made the biggest mistake of my life. I felt like no one could help me, that I couldn't give this baby back. <laughs> I tried. I was like, put her back in. <laughs> We're not ready. Oh. And when I got home, it got worse because I wasn't sleeping. I, I, I wanted to hurt my husband real bad. Um, but I just felt just ill-equipped and I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't eating and breastfeeding came very easily, but it was a lot of breast milk. It was spraying the walls. So that was it, was, it was just a mess that no one had prepared me for. And long story short, thankfully I had a therapist who I was seeing regularly. Um, I went in when I was around eight months postpartum, and she, at that time, she recommended that I check myself into a psychiatric facility for treatment. And at that point, nothing was funny. Yeah. The world was gray, and I love color. <laughs> but the world had just turned this dark, hopeless place, and I went willingly to the psychiatric facility because I knew I could sleep there, and I knew that I could get away from my baby and my husband. So I was like, let's go, okay? <laughs> right, kind of like here, today, right now. I'm like, uh oh, I can go somewhere without them. Bye, gotta go, right? Um, but yes, and it was at that point, I checked myself into the hospital willingly, and I was there for 10 days. And during that time, I had time for myself. I could shower. I was in very intensive therapy, but it was not the ideal place, not only for me as a woman, um, but you know, as a mom, I was the only mom in this whole facility. And I was the only black person mm. in this facility, including the medical staff. Long story short, I, I've said that a lot tonight. I'm aware, okay. Um, but I, well, I spent the 10 days in the psych ward. I got out. My family finally heard me. My family supported me like no other. My cousins flew from New York to Los Angeles, supported me. Every week I had more support. We put my daughter in daycare so that I could have breaks. I could return back to work as a stand-up comic. And then that's when I got my permission. Mm -hmm. I got my permission from the audience, right? I was sharing my life story on stage and people were like, yes, me too. And for the longest, it felt like the new Me Too movement. It was like, oh, my, either I was depressed or my mom was depressed or my sister had postpartum, or I think that that's why my sister has changed or has become different, right? So I got my permission from the audience, not from myself or my therapy or any of the personal work that I was doing. Um, and I realized that I wasn't the only one. So I've made it my mission to let moms know, you are not alone. Thank you. You know we're not alone, because I heard in the audience, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I could see you, I know all the heads would be nodding, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Marion, let's bring this back to you. Um, I want to just talk about this connection between mental health and healthcare overall. We tend to carve out mental health as separate from the rest of healthcare, but the two are absolutely connected, as we've just seen in the story we've heard from Angelina. And I wonder if you can talk about the connection and also talk about the implications of this, because this is really, really serious stuff. Yes, this is really a key question, and thanks for asking. Uh, today, mental health, mental disorders are 
the biggest burden of health in the 21st century. And one reason for that is that patients with psychiatric disorders have more often than the general public comorbid medical disorders, and they're not diagnosed because people don't are not aware of that. And today, the organization of care is separated between health, mental health, and somatic care. And this is absurd because we need to have one health. We are one person and we need really to take care of the whole person. And just to give you a few figures, the consequences are, are dramatic, uh, despite the fact that they can be prevented and treated. So for example, the, uh, because of, of not diagnosing and not treating somatic comorbid disorders, patients with severe mental disorders lose from 10 to 15 years of life because they die earlier. The second problem is that the first cause of death are cardiovascular disorders, which now are known to be a, one of the biggest problems in women. It's been ignored for years. And the cause of that is uh, that they have more frequently, when they are depressed or they have bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, they have more frequently what's called metabolic syndrome, which is very easy to diagnose. It's obesity, hypertension, abnormal li li lipid profile or glycemia. This is not diagnosed. In the patients we see in our expert centers in France, uh, which are networks coordinated by Fondation Fondamentale, Patients that arrive, in 90% of cases, they have a metabolic syndrome which is not diagnosed and not treated. So it's good that we talk about it because it's also important that um, patients with a mental disorder do believe that they also have a body that needs to be treated because they are more at risk because of other conditions that we don't have time to discuss today, yeah. which explain these comorbid uh, questions. It's so frustrating. It makes me want to storm off the stage. <laughs> Tom, you and I talked um, the other day about girls in particular, and girls are seeming to taking, be taking the lead in a lot of your community-based work, um, but they also experience depression and anxiety at higher levels than boys. And I'm curious, uh, you had some theories on why this might be, and I, I thought it might be interesting yeah. for you to share that with, with this audience. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think the challenge we're facing in Kenya is we, uh, and to some extent it's also a challenge that is being faced globally, uh, is the world is changing so rapidly and, and so quickly, um, and especially uh, for young people uh, in the developing world. And what I mean by this, for example, is, you know, when um, I was growing up, um, my mom uh, didn't go to high school, you know, so uh, and so she was in what we will consider a very traditional family setup, you know, where gender roles and what women call aspire uh, for are completely different from, you know, when my um, sister was going to school uh, and also for younger, you know, girls and women who are right now, uh, you know, kind of living in, in this world, right? So basically what we are seeing in, in Kenya um, is uh, one, a mix of a really changing world where you know, gender roles are changing, um, aspirations for, for girls and women are changing, uh, but they're still finding themselves in societies which is still traditionally built to be, you know, um, um, quote unquote conservative. And in the same, you know, uh, place, you're also having this increasing globalization through like social media, for example. So social media um, has led to um, almost what well, you're finding, at least from our research in Kenya, um, is social media is causing a lot of stress around, you know, like body image, uh, peer pressure, social acceptance, um, and all of these ingredients are kind of working in this melting point that is really exacerbating the the, the, the environmental stressors and risk factors that can contribute towards the development of, you know, depression, anxiety, and other common mental health problems among, you know, young girls and, 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 and young women. Um, um, in Kenya, right? And so to tie it back to, you know, um, what the, the doctor was mentioning earlier, you know, we already know that girls and women are, are, are at risk of at least the more common mental health disorders like depression and anxiety. We still don't fully know why that is the case. What we are realizing is there are newer emerging stressors, you know, um, social media being one of them you know, changing social, cultural, environment being another, another one, and even climate change, you know, so one thing we found this year, which is quite interesting, uh, was that young women in Kenya are more anxious and worried about climate change than 
you know, uh, young men are, right? And, and, and all of these emerging stresses and emerging um, 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 things are making it even more, you know, um, complicated for, for young girls and young women. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we work almost two thirds of the, of the people we work with, either as caregivers um, or, you know, kind of through a programming, you know, um, a gap. Like one thing which may be, uh, young men and boys also perhaps need to learn from from young girls and young women is we found uh, women to be more willing to seek help to be more eager to seek help mm -hmm. and especially within this you know um, group context um, and, and so at least that is one thing that gives me a lot of optimism around the work that we're doing thank you for using the word optimism mm -hmm. i I have two more questions. They're going to really be mad at me because our time is up. But I cannot walk off the stage without mentioning the word stigma mm. and taboo. So you each have one second. Great. Marion, why don't <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I see it in your eyes. You're mad at me. <laughs> but let's just talk really quickly, really, really, really quickly about the stigma, which still exists and it's just unacceptable. Well, thank you for organizing such conversation, because to reduce stigma, we need exactly to do that. We need to talk about what we just discussed here everywhere, at dinners, in households. Uh, we need to have celebrities sitting on stages to have the courage, like you did, to explain and describe that mental disorders, depression, for example, are disorders like any other ones that need to be diagnosed and treated. And also, we need to share the idea that there is optimism. We can be convincing in and saying that these disorders can be treated, they just need to be recognized, diagnosed and treated as early as possible. Totally. And I will say, since the theme of the, of the conference is education, I, I find that because the way we've approached maternal health specifically, mm -hmm. maybe I would say mental health also as well, Doctor, hopefully you'll agree, um, is that stigma keeps us from being educated yeah. about it. And luckily with my work and my approach <laughs> to this work is that humor and finding the funny and us having these conversations allows us to be better educated yeah. and thus better prepared to be the people, the mothers, the parents that we all hope to be. So it's important that we have these conversations in different ways. Mm -hmm. And my contribution is in a funny way. So <laughs> hopefully people can find humor in, in the things that I do. Um, but it's important that we switch up the way we educate ourselves about mental health and the way we address it. And the way I do it is in a 40 foot pink bus and <laughs> with a couple of jokes. <laughs> Tom, I, I, I do want to, to give you a, a moment just to respond to the stigma thought. Uh, you have no time, so yeah. <laughs> make a follow. Uh, so I think how, how we are doing it is by uh, decolonizing mental health, by you know, thinking about mental health from a very pro-Kenyan, pro-African perspective, figuring out what well-being means for us and taking charge of our own narrative. Thank Love you. it. Love it. Okay, Tom. Are you an optimist in the field of mental health? Optimist. I am. Uh, are you, I'm, and I'm I, yeah, there's no time. Are you an, it's a yes or no question. Are, Angelina, are you an optimist in the field of mental health? As long health? as I keep making it funny, absolutely, <laughs> I'm an optimist. Marion, this is your moment. Uh, we, we can be optimistic as long as we have funding to do research and innovation. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. We need thank the money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining our panel. I appreciate it. Okay.